Today we are going over a step-by-step -step guide on seed starting. So if you've thought about starting a garden, this is going to be just a simple get started with some seeds, give you an overview of what you can expect to do. If you're looking for a tutorial on using heating pads and grow lights and really getting in depth with seed starting, this is not the video. This is just simple seed starting in a window with a little mini greenhouse, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, step one is going to be make a plan. You need a plan to get started with your seed starting. I know it can be overwhelming when you're looking at all these different seeds and all these different seed starting options and where do you start, when do you plant them. All of these questions we're going to talk about today. We are currently in March here in Massachusetts and there is a nor'easter going on, the snow is coming down, the wind is going, and now is the time to start seeds but we're starting them indoors so that they're protected from the elements and that we can germinate them in a warm environment. So that's going to be key. So plants in order to grow, they're going to need soil, sunlight, the correct temperatures and the correct amount of water. Okay, so step one in your plan is going to be to go to the Old Farmer's Almanac online. You can do that one of two ways. You can go do a Google search for the Farmer's Almanac planting calendar, or you can go to www.almanac.com slash gardening slash planting dash calendar. When you get to that page, it is going to ask you to enter your location. By entering your location, which I just put my zip code in because that's going to search for the area closest to where you're located and then click search. When you do that, it is going to come up with an entire planting calendar for your area. This is huge because this is really going to answer a lot of your questions for planting in your area because where I live and where you live is going to be a different planting calendar unless you're in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. <laughs> hey, if you are. So I did print mine out. When you pull up the planting calendar for your area, it is going to tell you when your last spring frost date is. So for my area, the last spring frost date is April 28th for this calendar year, 2023. So that tells me that we could have freezing temperatures till around that point, and I don't want to plant my new plants out in the garden before that date. Now when that date gets close, we're gonna be watching the weather and we're going to decide when it's safe to plant our plants outside. You might see on a seed packet that it says to start your plants indoors three to four weeks before your last frost. They want you to count back from that April 28th frost date, if that's the case, and count back three to four weeks, and that's when you start your seeds for a particular variety. A lot of the seeds you're gonna start are going to be started six weeks before your last frost date that you're going to count back. But you don't have to stress about when to plant those because if you print off the planting dates for your area, they're all going to be listed on each page so that you can just look and see that basil, we're going to plant that indoors on March 2nd and March 17th. So there's a window of time that you can plant that indoors. And not only does that tell you the date to start that seed indoors, but it also tells you the transplant date. So not only does it tell you the dates to start your seeds indoors, but those seeds, once they become seedlings and that plant has grown inside, it tells you when to move that plant out to the garden. So for basil, it wants you to move it out April 28th through May 19th for my area. And then the final column will be for starting seeds outdoors. So that is for seeds that can be directly sown outdoors without starting them inside, which can be pretty convenient to be able to just place the seeds in your raised bed or in your garden beds outdoors without starting them from seeds inside. And so it'll give you that date if that is 
a recommended option. So this can really help to plan out your seeds. So I went ahead and I used a highlighter so that I would know which seeds I would be direct sowing and which seeds I'd be starting early indoors and which seeds would have a late start. So for instance, Cucumbers grow really fast. So we're starting this three to four weeks before our last frost date. So I'm not gonna start this until maybe April 1st, but we're in March right now and there's plenty of other seeds that I wanna start earlier because they don't grow as quickly as say a cucumber. And so those will be my early starts, which are highlighted in yellow. That's what I'm going to focus on today because those are the ones that need to be started early. And when we get to April 1st, I can consult this list to see the late starts so I know which ones I'm going to be starting then. And then when we get to the time of direct sowing, I have those highlighted in orange so I know which ones to do for that. So it just helps to keep things more organized. The other thing I like about this is it's giving you a broad list of different fruits and vegetables and herbs that you can grow. And so you can go down the list and decide on that which ones you're going to be planting. So I highlighted the ones that I want to plant and whether they're gonna be a late start, early start, or direct sow. And then you wanna decide how many of each plant you'd like to start with. And yes, of course, that can be hard to figure out because you don't know how many will actually germinate. You don't know how many will successfully grow in your garden and how much the yield is going to be. Honestly, each year that I have a garden, the yield is different. No matter how much you plan, there's so many things that can affect your yield. And so you just take your best guess as to what you think you're going to want to grow in your garden. One year I planted eight tomato plants and I was overwhelmed with how many tomatoes I got from each plant and I was canning, I was freezing tomatoes. My freezer was so full of tomatoes and my cupboards were full of canned tomatoes. It just got to be too much. So then the following year I just did two tomato plants. Well, guess what? That wasn't enough. We didn't have enough to do the canning that we wanted to do. So then you go in the middle to make a plan for somewhere in the middle of that. And you adjust each year and figure it out as you go. Okay, so you've got your plan in place. You've got it all written out. Step two is going to be getting all your supplies that you're going to need. So by planning first, that gives you an idea as to how many pots you're gonna need, how many seed trays, how many seed packets you need to get and of which varieties. So these are all things that planning ahead of time will help you with that. And you can definitely get these supplies on a budget. That's how I got started. I knew that I was gonna need lots of pots. So I was always checking online for people giving away extra pots, especially in late spring when everyone's getting their flowers and vegetables and they're they want to recycle their pots that they get from the garden store because they're not using them. That's a great time to grab them and store them away until you need them the following spring. So I got these from a free Craigslist ad. I got a lot of them from friends and family who didn't need them after they planted their flowers and other starts that they had gotten for their garden. So it was great to be able to get most of it for free. I did get these biodegradable pots on sale at Ocean State Job Lot. So these, however, they were inexpensive, but this is a one-time use kind of thing because they do break down. This originally held some patience from the store, but it is now gonna be reused as a pot to hold my tomato seedlings. Now the pots that I start my seeds in are varying sizes. This one's three inches. This one is three and a half inches. And then this one is almost two and a half inches. So this is what I start my seeds in. And depending on what I'm growing, if they're starting to outgrow the pot where the roots are coming out the bottom, that's when I will move them to a bigger pot. So some seedlings you can get away with a small pot and then move them out to your garden. Other faster growing plants, once I see those roots coming out, I'll move them to a larger pot. Like this is a five and a half inch pot, but significantly wider. You do wanna make sure that whatever pots you're using, that they have drainage holes underneath where the water can drain out. 
and also be absorbed up in. So if you're gonna use something like say a solo cup, you can certainly use a plastic solo cup. Just make sure that you drill a hole in the bottom to allow for drainage because you don't want your roots to get wet and not be able to drain the soil because then they can get soggy and the roots can rot. So that's where the seed trays come in. I have found that my seeds do better if I add water to the tray that the pot is in and it allows the water to absorb into the soil so that the roots can pull the water up and it takes the water that it needs and after 20 to 30 minutes after watering, if I see there's still a lot of water in the tray, I can just get rid of that excess water because the plant's going to take what it needs. And then daily I will be checking to make sure that the soil stays moist but not like dripping wet. You just want it to have just enough moisture so that it doesn't feel dry to the touch, but at the same time, it's not sitting in a puddle of water. So you wanna strike that balance. So you could have a single tray for a pot, or you can have a planting tray like this that you place all of your pots inside, or you can use something like a lunchroom cafeteria tray like I have here. That's just a flat tray with a little bit of a lip and I place my larger pots on there and that works well also. All depends on what's available that you can get. These trays were on clearance so I was able to pick that up. I did find some for free also on Craigslist. And the cafeteria trays I did purchase as like a bundle so it was discounted as a bundle. So definitely look for those savings where you can. So I know I said in the beginning like I don't use heating pads, I don't use grow lights. The reason I'm able to pull that off is because I have a mini indoor greenhouse that I have placed in a south facing sliding glass door. So the mini greenhouse with the plastic covering, it holds on to the heat and then the sun comes through that south facing glass door. So when I'm using a greenhouse with sunlight, the seedlings will grow towards the sun. So when I see the seedlings are reaching towards the sun, I will go and I will turn either the individual pot or I can just take my whole tray and spin that so that way the seedling will start to grow in the other direction because we're trying to keep the seedlings as straight as possible when they're growing. Now if you use a grow light that you have hanging right above your seedlings, <laughs> they're gonna grow up towards that light. So you can certainly control it doing that. So you have options in that department. I like that I was able to get a greenhouse for $31 from Ocean State Job Lot, and I'm not plugging in any heating pads. I'm just using the plastic over the greenhouse and sunlight to warm up the temperature inside the greenhouse where the plants are growing because they do like to have warm temperatures. And I have the option to keep the front flap open or closed depending on the temperature and humidity levels. And I'm able to grow seedlings for my garden while keeping the cost minimal. And that was a goal of mine was to keep costs down, especially when just starting out with gardening. Now seedlings will grow, like I said, straighter. They may germinate and grow better with a grow light and with a heating pad underneath. So that is absolutely a route that you can take if you wanna invest in those things in a, in a shelf to be able to keep each of those on with the grow lights hanging. So the other supplies you're gonna need would be your seeds, all the seeds that you want to plant. So seeds are relatively inexpensive, which is why seed starting is less expensive versus if you were gonna buy all started plants at the store, you can get your seeds significantly cheaper. I have gotten seeds for free from my public library. I have gotten seeds at the dollar store where they were like four for a dollar, which is a really great price. I've also found seeds at my local tractor supply. Also my local feed store had a sale on seeds and I was able to get a bunch. I have purchased seeds online as well from MI Gardener and Renee's Garden. And most seed packets are gonna have a significant amount of seeds like this has approximately 50 cucumber seeds. I am definitely not planting 50 cucumber plants. So with this, you do have the option to either save the seeds to use in your garden the following season, which I absolutely do. I've got quite a seed selection that I saved up and I just use them each year. And another great way is to share your seeds with friends and family. 
or swap seeds. You can find someone to swap seeds with, so maybe give them half the cucumber seeds in exchange for half of their tomato seeds and that way you have what you need for your garden without all the excess. Your plants are going to need to be watered so having some sort of watering can for watering for the longest time I just used a Rubbermaid plastic pitcher and then this fall someone had this on the side of the road for free and it was so cute and I picked it up and it's got the little holes to water I actually really like this so I've been using this now and you can't beat free. <laughs> okay, so then we get into labeling your plants. It's really important to label them so that you know what plant is what because when they're all popping up and they're all green, it can be really hard to tell them apart. So ways that you can mark that is if you wanna write directly on the pot. I don't like to do that personally because I reuse these pots every single year and that would just get confusing having pots labeled differently because each year I don't always plant the exact same amount or same varieties. So I have used these little plastic markers from the dollar store in their gardening section where I write with a sharpie and I stick that right in there. So this is an option. I did find that when left out in the garden sun for a while the sharpie started to wear off but it did last as far as germinating them and growing the seedlings inside. It did last for that part, so, so you may just have to rewrite it if you're going to continue using it in the garden. I got craft sticks, so popsicle sticks from the dollar store as well. For these, I'll be breaking them in half, writing the variety on it and sticking those in. So good to have some Sharpie, some permanent markers on hand for labeling. Okay, and then the last supply item would be saran wrap or a plastic dome to cover up your seeds. So when you first start seeds, it can help to place a plastic cover over them in order to keep the moisture in to help them germinate. You don't want the soil drying out while they are trying to germinate but you only keep the cover on them until you start to see the green plants, the little seedlings coming through, then take that cover off. A couple of the free trays that I had gotten on the side of the road for a Craigslist ad came with the trays, but as you can see, they really didn't hold up. They've got a bunch of holes in them, and so I didn't find these to be great for more than a season or two. Using saran wrap as a cover is quick and easy and you're only using it for a short period of time over the course of a few days or weeks while waiting for your seedlings to germinate. All right, so step three is going to be filling your pots with soil and getting them watered. Now when you're picking out soil to be able to fill your pots. You don't wanna go in your backyard and just put any soil in there. You wanna get potting soil. So, so potting soil is going to be formulated to have the nutrients that your seed needs to grow and your seedling to germinate. Make sure when you go to the store to get your potting mix in the garden section that you're actually getting a bag that says potting mix and not garden soil. So if you use garden soil, there's a really good chance that your seedling won't do well. As far as brands of potting soil to use, I honestly just grab whatever potting soil that I can find at my local Home Depot. And each year it's been different and I've successfully grown plants each year. However, when I can find it, I do like to get an organic potting soil. Since I'm taking the time and the effort to grow my own food, I wanna make sure that food is as healthy as possible, so I do try to get an organic potting soil when I can. So that's what I'm using this year. So when you are watering your pots, you just wanna get the potting soil wet. Whether you do that before you put it into these pots, that's an option, or you can water them after you put them in the pots. You can water them from above. You can water the tray. I've done it both ways. Once the seeds are in, you want to try to avoid watering from above because that can displace the seeds. It can push them too far down, making it hard for them to germinate. But having the soil moist to start with is really helpful 
So you can just place your seeds. It's already watered and moist, ready to go for your seedlings. You can cover them up. Okay, step four is going to be planting your seeds and labeling them. So you want to take your seed packet, consult your old farmer's almanac planting calendar. So I got basil here for basil. It says it's highlighted in yellow, meaning that it is an early start. So I'm gonna get that started today. So I'm gonna look at my list. I see that I want to plant six basil plants. And then I look at the seeds that I have. I've got two types of basil. I've got a sweet Italian basil from Ferry Morse, and I've also got a Genovese basil from Seeds of Change. And personally, I like variety, so I'll probably do a few of these as well as a few of these. Now when I say I want six plants, doesn't mean that if I plant six seeds that that's what I'm going to get. I always plant more. And then as far as planting depth, each seed packet should say how deep to plant your seed. So this one says a quarter inch in depth. So that's not far at all. The same with this one, quarter inch in depth. So I'm just going to make a slight indent with my finger, place the seed in, and then just brush some soil over the top to cover it up. But this is clearly a plant that likes its seed to start very close to the surface. Now you can absolutely go through and do all your labels ahead of time based off of how many plants you want of each. So that way you don't have soil on your hands when you're writing them. But personally, I write them as I go. Because sometimes I change my mind or make some changes along the way. And so I just do it as I go. On my markers, I like to write the variety name. So the Genovese basil. And I like to write the date that I am starting it. So that way, if it hasn't germinated, I will look at the back of the seed packet. It'll say that it should germinate or not. This seed packet, I can't seem to find anywhere where it says the germination time, which is unusual. So on this one, this one says days to germination is five to 10 days for this basil variety, the sweet Italian. So if in 10 days, I'm still not seeing germination, having the date on here will let me know that it's been 10 days. And also when it comes time to planting, I can make sure that my dates match up with the planting calendar dates for when I can move them outside. So I get them labeled. I place that in. Now seeds can be super tiny. So I will try to pour into my hand what I need and pick them up one at a time and place them in. I do try to spread the seeds out so that they are far enough apart that if they all germinate, I can separate them into separate pots so that way they can grow their roots with enough space. Or if I don't have enough pots to accommodate that, then I can pull out the weaker sized ones and discard those and just keep the strongest ones. But when planting seedlings, you should account for having extra pots to be able to place these extra seeds that germinate and also for switching these over to larger pots for certain seedlings that grow. So I do have a lot of pots in my two greenhouses. However, there still is space where I can put in larger pots, which is definitely something I'm going to need for my larger plants that I'm going to be growing. I've used this one greenhouse for years. This is the first year that I got a second greenhouse that I'm trying out because I want to be able to have more plant options in my garden, as well as the option to sell additional plants. So to make the holes, use your finger to make a small indent, or you can use a little Sharpie, to make a little indent. I just happen to have four seeds in my hand here. So I'm going to drop in one, two, three, four, and then I'm just going to cover it up like so. And the soil's nice and moist. And then I repeat that for the rest of the seeds. So the sweet Italian basil. Ooh, that came out fast. I'm gonna do four of these as well. I know I have plenty of pots, so if they all germinate, I'll just move them into other pots.
So after you have planted all your seeds, you'll cover them up with your saran wrap or your plastic dome, place them in the greenhouse, close up the greenhouse door so that way it holds on to the temperature and the humidity and keep a close eye on it. I do like to keep a thermometer inside of the greenhouse so that I can keep track of the temperature and it's just a quick visual to be able to look in and see where it's at so I can open and close the greenhouse door as needed. So on a really sunny day with a lot of sunlight coming through, that greenhouse can get like 90 degrees. It can get quite warm in there. And then having all of the watered pots in there can cause humidity. And so you want to keep an eye on that temperature and make sure the temperature is not spiking too hot. Make sure the temperature is not dropping too cold. If the temperature is getting too chilly, you're gonna to wanna to close that door up, keep that heat in, especially when the sun's going down, you want to make sure that door is closed to hold on to the heat for the evening when there's no sun to help heat the greenhouse. So I do keep those closed overnight. Having the extra heat in there really helps with germination. I personally try to keep the greenhouse between 68 degrees and 86. I try not to let it get into the 90s and I try not to let it drop below 68. You want to try to find a balance in there for your plants to have an ideal temperature. So step six is going to be making sure that your little seed in the soil is staying nice and moist, the saran wrap cover is staying on there, and that the temperature is ideal for germination. And once you see that little green growth coming through, those little seedlings popping up, you're going to move on to step seven, which is removing the saran wrap and allowing the little seedling to get air circulation and continue to grow all the while monitoring the soil to make sure that it's moist and that they are getting the sunlight that they need and that the temperatures are nice and warm for them. And then the last step with seeds starting is you're going to be turning your pots or your seedling trays as needed to make sure that they are not leaning too far in one direction going towards the sun. Also, if you're interested in some of the items that I talked about here for starting your seeds, I will leave some Amazon links down below so that you can check out those products. These indoor greenhouses work really well for me. The only modifications that I did make with them is adding little zip ties on each level to hold the grates in place because I did find that they shifted a bit when I am moving my planting trays. So some zip ties on there just keeps everything nice and steady. And as far as putting the greenhouses together, it took my five-year-old son and I about five minutes to put the whole thing together. It was really simple and very easy to do. We can easily take it apart and pack it away each season when we're done with it. So that's nice that it can be compactly stored. If you learned some valuable information in this video, we'd really appreciate if you'd give us a like. And if you enjoy the content, we'd love for you to subscribe and see more of our gardening content, farming, raising goats and chickens. We've got lots of great videos. In the next seed starting video, we will talk about up potting your plants. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you enjoyed this seed starting video, you should check out our video about how to make a container garden. That has some great tips on making your own container garden on a back deck to be able to grow fruits and vegetables right outside your door in a small space. And if you haven't started your farm yet, what are you waiting for? Get your farm on. Farm, a wicked awesome farm. <laughs> Watch this channel to learn what to do. We love to farm and we'll show you. Yeah, welcome to our show. Whoa. <laughs> Just one more story farm.